Are you ready to build a website that's going to knock your audience's socks off? Well, look no further than Squarespace, today's sponsor. This all-in-one platform is your one-stop shop for creating a stunning website and growing your online presence. Stick around for more details about them in a bit. In today's geographics, we're going to travel to London, but rather than exploring a single destination, we're going to chart the history of an institution through its various physical incarnations. An institution which became synonymous with chaos, madness, neglect, and suffering. There was a time when mental illness was poorly understood and treated even more poorly. A time when mental health patients were dismissed as mad or lunatics, meaningless terms which expressed the contempt with which society treated them. At that time, for those patients, hell was very real on earth, and hell had a name, Bedlam. The long history of the hospital, colloquially known as Bedlam, started in the 1200s and continues up to this day. Throughout the centuries, Bedlam changed location four times, but it was always located in and around London. The premises which housed it sometimes were cramped and shabby, sometimes they were grandiose. But for most of its history, Bedlam was consistently administered by little more than sadistic crooks who mistreated their patients and exploited them for a profit. That is until the early 19th century, when the institution received a major makeover and patients enjoyed humane treatment. But let's take it from the start. Our story begins with a gift. In the early 13th century, an English knight arose from humble origin seeking glory in the Fifth Crusade. His name was Simon Fitzmary. While in the Holy Land, he developed a veneration for the Virgin Mary and for the Star of Bethlehem, which had announced the birth of Jesus. Upon returning to England in 1221, Simon became Sheriff of London, and to show his devotion, he gifted a piece of land to the Bishop of Bethlehem, Goffredo de Profeti. This land was in the Bishop's Gate ward of the City of London. This is a site now occupied by Liverpool Street Station. The bishop made good use of the land by establishing the Priory of St. Mary of Bethlehem, inaugurated in 1247. Part of the Priory was designated as a hospital in the medieval sense. This meant that the friars would offer shelter to anybody who needed a temporary place to stay. Pilgrims, travellers, the poor. By 1330, the Priory was entirely dedicated to this welcoming function, making it a full-time hospital. It was a small, single-story building, covering an area of just two acres. It could accommodate only 12 rooms, a kitchen, a chapel, and an exercise yard. The institution was known as St. Mary of Bethlehem Hospital, then simply as Bethlehem. Londoners further shortened the name to Bethlehem, which morphed into the popular moniker Bedlam. Over the 14th century, friars started welcoming also the sick, the infirm, and generally those who could not care for themselves. This must have placed some strain on the finances of the friars. By 1346, the religious order could not keep up with running costs, and the hospital's administration was taken over by the City of London. <laughs> Sometime between 1346 and 1400, the hospital started caring for psychiatric patients. These patients were generically described as being mad or lunatics. It is likely they suffered from learning disabilities, dementia, or epilepsy. By 1403, records show that most of the occupants at Bethlehem suffered from similar conditions. This would make the hospital one of the oldest, if not the oldest, psychiatric institution in Europe. In a way, Bedlam could be described as a pioneering institution for its time, but that doesn't mean that it was a well-run one. In the same year, 1403, the hospital treasurer, Peter Travener, was found guilty of embezzlement of hospital property. This was the first recorded instance of mismanagement, which would plague the institution for decades to come. One of the immediate consequences of mismanagement was the worsening of living conditions for patients, which were generally squalid. Guests were often neglected, left to their own devices, or worse, they endured harsh mistreatment. This is hinted at by inventories of equipment in use during the 14th and 15th centuries. Bedlam personnel made extensive use of chains, manacles, locks and stocks. This was in line with past convictions when it came to treating psychiatric conditions. It was believed that forceful restraint, isolation, and the shock of corporeal punishment could somehow cure patients. For much of the following decades, Bedlam continued to operate undisturbed. Then, in 1536, King Henry VIII dissolved the religious orders and confiscated their properties. Bedlam was administered by the City of London, but it was still property of a religious order. The king took the occasion to seize the hospital for the crown before fully transferring ownership of it to the City of London in 1547. In 1574, Bedlam changed hands once again. London's Municipal Council transferred control of the institution to the governors of a larger hospital, Bridewell. 
The Bridewell governors first instituted a practice which would become a staple of Bedlam, allowing wealthy members of the public to pay a fee and visit the asylum as one would stroll through a zoo. This practice may have contributed to the hospital's notoriety, so much so that by the end of the 16th century, the name Bedlam had become synonymous with madness or generalized confusion. The name also started to appear in literary works, especially plays. To quote just two examples, in William Shakespeare's Henry VI Part II, the character Lord Clifford exclaims, To Bedlam with him is the man grown mad, the man being King Henry. And in King Lear, the character of Edgar assumes the persona of Tom of Bedlam, a wandering beggar who has been discharged from the hospital. Some endorsement from the Bard surely contributed to Bedlam's fame. But it was what happened within those walls that secured the hospital's infamy for decades and centuries to come. Are you tired of the hassle and stress that comes with building a website? Well, Squarespace, our sponsor for today's video, is here to save the day. With their user-friendly drag-and-drop method, even the least tech-savvy among us can create a professional-looking website. Plus, their analytics and insights give you a deep understanding of your audience and how they interact with your content, allowing you to make informed decisions and drive more traffic to your site. But that's not all. Squarespace also allows you to integrate email campaigns and monetize your content with the Members Area feature. Stand out from the competition and convert email subscribers into loyal customers with Squarespace's templates and automation features. And look, don't take our word for it. Try Squarespace for yourself with their free trial. And when you're ready to launch your site, just go to squarespace.com geographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Trust us, your audience will thank you. And now back to today's video. The governors of the hospital in the early 1600s adopted a very strict admission policy. They would take in only those patients described as raving and furious and yet capable of cure. This was an important caveat. It implied that the governors would at least try to help patients. In the 17th century, in fact, general attitudes towards so-called madness and lunacy began to shift. These ailments were no longer ascribed to God's punishment or possession, and as such, they could and should be treated. In 1619, Halkia Crook became Bedlam's first governor with a medical qualification. Unfortunately, his surname perfectly matched his character. In 1632, a royal commission discovered that Crook had cooked the books embezzling funds destined to provide food and basic comforts to his patients. Luckily, Crook was dismissed in 1633. His successors would also be medical professionals, a fact which unfortunately would not prevent patients from being subjected to squalid conditions nor being regularly abused in the name of quack science. One of the issues uh, which made life hell for patients was the chronic overcrowding. By the 1660s, the hospital had been enlarged to accommodate 59 patients, but this was not nearly enough to meet actual demand. Patient rooms and common areas were permanently cramped, and the overall structure was described by contemporary witnesses as old, weak, and ruinous, too small and straight. Another concern was the poor sanitary conditions. In the 17th century, a filthy hospital was the norm, but it appears that Bedlam was even worse. The sewer running under the building was constantly blocked, a sure way to guarantee regular outbreaks of infections. Above ground, matters were no better, with piles of filth permanently blocking the entrances. Even if a Bedlam patient did not catch cholera, the staff would make sure to make their lives miserable. The generalized squalor and overcrowding naturally caused the inmates to protest and riot on a regular basis. The Bedlam orderlies naturally responded with frequent and brutal beatings. And even if patients were on the best of behavior, the normal course of treatment was tantamount to torture. Patients did not receive differential psychiatric diagnoses, of course, as psychiatry didn't exist. They were all grouped under the category of mad lunatics, potentially dangerous, whose raving antics had to be violently quelled by physical means. The lucky ones were simply confined or restrained in their cells, often with the use of chains and harnesses. Those less lucky were subjected to regular bloodletting, purged, forced to vomit, and dumped into freezing cold water. Presumably, death must have been a common occurrence within the hospital, which had its own graveyard. This was uncovered in 2013, following excavations around the Liverpool Street site. The graves, the most recent dating back to 1569, contained some 20,000 bodies. It should be specified that it was very likely that the majority of bodies belonged to Londoners who had not actually died at Bedlam, but were buried there due to lack of space in their parish churches. So, to recap, by the mid-1600s, hospital administrators had to deal with overcrowding and overflowing filth. Their patients, on the other hand, had to contend with institutionalized abuse. So, what could be a possible solution? Cleaning the sewers? Expanding the old priory in St. Mary? Or 
God forbid, you know, treating patients like humans? <laughs> of course not. It was a much better solution. Tear down the old bedlam and build a new hospital. The perfect occasion to do so came about in September of 1666. From the 2nd to the 6th of September 1666, London was ravaged by the Great Fire, which raised to the grounds more than 13,000 houses. The flames had spared Bedlam, and now there was plenty of free real estate in town, as well as a great drive to rebuild London. A private consortium agreed on a sweeping building program so that London could rise from its ashes. This program included the reconstruction of several hospitals, and the Royal Bethlehem Asylum would be the first to benefit. A new, impressive building was designed to be erected in Moorgate, not far from the original Liverpool Street site. The architect in charge was Robert Hooke, who drew inspiration from the Royal Tuileries Palace in Paris, incorporating Corinthian columns and a dome towering above the 540-foot-long facade. The Moorgate site opened in 1676 and would eventually include four more gardens with avenues lined by trees. The opulent facade, however, was just an ornate front, which concealed deep-seated structural problems. The new build was so heavy and its foundations so weak that the load-bearing walls at the front cracked almost immediately. Those cracks filled with water as it soon started raining, which led to dampness and unhealthy living conditions. These engineering issues were a perfect metaphor for the medical and administrative squalor which continued to plague the institution. In 1728, James Monroe became the chief physician at Bedlam, inaugurating a dynasty of sadistic doctors and residents. His son John and later his grandson Thomas held sway over the hospital for 87 years, enacting a reign of terror which would see patients regularly beaten and starved. All the while, they supplemented the hospital's finances by allowing thousands of paying visitors to tour the facility as if it were a macabre menagerie of madness. During their tenure, the Monroes hired some unsavory characters. For example, Chief Surgeon Brian Crowther, who in the 1790s took to dissecting dead patients, looking to find the difference between healthy and diseased brains. Or John Haslam, head of management, who intensified the use of torture on patients. In his view, the first step to curing lunatics was to break their will with corporal punishment. The misdeeds of the Monroe, Haslam, and Crowther trio eventually permeated outside the hospital walls. In 1814, Quaker philanthropist Edward Wakefield decided to investigate. He forced his way into Bedlam, bringing along a group of members of Parliament. The small mission was horrified by what they saw. One of the many observations made by Wakefield involved a former American Marine, James Norris. He had been interred at Bedlam on the 1st of February 1800 for unknown reasons and had been kept in the wing for incurable patients. Wakefield found that for the previous 12 years, Norris had been chained to a wall, his arms pinned to the sides by iron bars. The British Parliament promptly launched a formal inquiry, which led to the dismissal of Thomas Monroe, Halsam, and Crowther in 1815. The inquiry also had another effect. The old Palace of Horror was torn down and Bedlam was relocated to the neighbourhood of St George's Fields in the district of Southwark, South London. The new site was better conceived, better built and more spacious than the previous Moorgate site, providing an overall more pleasant experience. The hospital was built over four floors with extensive grounds. Male and female patients resided in separate wings divided by a central administrative block. Residents also had access to exercise yards, modern baths and a recreation hall. An 1818 report found that the administration had made great progress. Patients were kept clean, well clothed, and did not suffer from restraints worthy of the Spanish Inquisition. Bedlam was not a bedlam any longer. It deserved to be called Bethlehem Hospital again. Conditions further improved from the 1850s onwards when Dr. William Hood became the head physician at Bethlehem and created a program focused on the rehabilitation of patients. Dr. Hood ensured that patients were well treated and that they spent no more than 12 months within the walls of the hospital. Only exceptional cases deemed incurable were kept for longer periods in a special ward. For all patients, the day started before 7 a.m. A nurse unlocked their bedroom doors and brought them a cup of tea. After eating breakfast, patients got on with their day, which mainly consisted of occupational therapy. Therapy. In other words, they were assigned manual chores such as washing laundry or gardening to keep themselves busy at all times. In the mid-1800s, psychotherapy was still a distant concept, so doctors relied on the power of a calm environment, regular occupation, and relaxing leisure. Hydrotherapy was also common. It consisted of bathing patients in warm water for up to nine hours or dipping them in cold water as shock therapy. Psychiatric drugs were first introduced at Bethlehem by Dr. Smith in the late 1880s. In particular, sedatives such as sulfonol were recorded as being effective 
ostentatious in the production of sleep and the control of excitement. In 1889, physicians also introduced hypnotism to treat cases of mania and psychosis, but results were reported as disappointing. So, after a day of chores and or bathing, at 4 p.m. patients were returned to their wards. Here, they had the chance to entertain themselves with pleasurable activities. They could step into the exercise yards for a game of croquet or bowls or tennis, or they could stay inside and read a book. Even better, they could contribute articles and poems to Under the Dome, the patient's quarterly magazine founded in 1889. And in 1892, the hospital provided yet more entertainment by inaugurating a permanent dance hall with a fixed stage. Leisure time was followed by dinner. Records from the 1880s show that patients enjoyed a varied and healthy diet with plenty of fish and meat pies served with vegetables and ale. Dinner, however, could be a time for confrontation, as certain patients refused to eat either because of severe depression or in defiance of hospital authorities. In extreme cases, the orderlies had to restrain the patients and feed them with nasal tubes and stomach pumps. At 9 p.m., patients were put to bed. All clothing was removed from their rooms and the doors locked as a measure against escapes. Most of them slept in the regular galleries. Men and women were kept in separate wings, of course, in which wide corridors opened onto individual patient rooms. The galleries were gaily decorated with paintings, flowers, and caged birds to provide an atmosphere of serenity. The most challenging patients would sleep in basement galleries or special wards reserved for noisy patients. Finally, those deemed unfit for recovery were kept in the incurable ward. By the 1850s, even the unruliest patients were no longer subjected to mechanical restraints such as chains or straitjackets. If an inmate was deemed dangerous to others or themselves, they would be locked in the padded room for short periods of time. If patients showed good signs of improvement, they were progressively moved to the upper wards. The stay on the fourth and last floor was the prelude for transfer to a convalescent establishment in Whitley, Surrey. Here, the daily routine was much more relaxed and was seen as the last step before returning home. The Victorian era Bethlehem was far from being the hellhole of previous centuries, and staff seriously cared about the well-being of their patients. However, one should not think that all was quiet and happy in the hospital at St. George's Fields. Patients were often misdiagnosed, and the treatments used were not the result of rigorous double-blind randomized clinical trials. Hence, most therapy courses ended in failure. The Bethlehem Museum of the Mind, inaugurated in March 2015, has collected dozens of clinical records of patients admitted in the 1880s and 1890s. Pouring through these reports really brings to life the challenges faced by both patients and healthcare professionals during the infancy of psychiatric science. Take Ada Jane Warren, for example, admitted on the 11th of November 1892. Shortly after the birth of her fourth child, Ada Jane had a tooth removed, a procedure which required the use of chloroform. Some days later, she started behaving erratically and paranoid with severe delusions. As a family doctor recorded, she said God had just opened the door of her room. Upon admission to Bethlehem, she claimed that her food had been poisoned and that her husband was trying to kill her. The record compiled by the hospital hinted that chloroform may have accelerated the first episodes, but the diagnosis was puerperal melancholia, a condition which today could be diagnosed as postnatal depression. Doctors also recorded her as being suicidal. During her first 12 months of Bethlehem, Ada Jane fluctuated between states of manic excitement and profound depression. She appeared to derive benefit from continuous bathing, but it was only temporary. Her stay was extended beyond the routine period, and in December, a doctor noted, No change. Is apparently becoming demented. Talks to herself, untidy in dress and coarse in appearance. On the 18th of April, 1894, Ada Jane was discharged uncured. The archives also contained some success stories, however, such as the one of Thomas George Callahan. Days before his admission in February 1888, the 17-year-old boy started to behave violently, destroying property and assaulting bystanders. He also claimed to see Jesus Christ and insisted that he had to save the world. The Bethlehem staff did not record a diagnosis, but reported that he had suffered a head injury 12 months prior. During his first three weeks in hospital, Thomas was still violent, harming himself and others while refusing to eat. He was kept in the padded room on and off until early March while being fed with a stomach pump. Not exactly the most promising start. But hospital notes recorded a marked improvement throughout the spring and summer until Thomas's early discharge on July the 3rd, 1888. A final note stated how the following year, on March the 26th, Thomas returned at the hospital for a visit. He was doing well and had started a military career. To quote, looks well and fat, has enlisted in the 57th Regiment. Success followed failure, and failure followed success, decade after decade. In 1930, city authorities decided to move Bethlehem Hospital to yet another location, Monk's Orchard House in the southern suburb of Croydon, where it still operates to this day, while the old building at St. George's Fields became the Imperial War Museum 
1936. Modern day Bethlehem Hospital is one of the largest and most important mental health hospitals in the United Kingdom. It works in conjunction with Maudsley, another psychiatric hospital, itself a partner of the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. But in the 2010s, two cases of negligence brought Bethlehem again under the spotlight. On the 31st of August 2010, 23-year-old Olaseni Seni Lewis was voluntarily admitted to Bethlehem following a psychotic episode. In the evening, Olaseni became agitated. After he damaged a door, Bethlehem staff called the police. Officers locked Lewis in a padded room, holding him face down and using leg restraints and two sets of handcuffs. The patient fell unconscious, succumbing to cerebral hypoxia and later to cardiac arrest. Olaseni died on September the 3rd. The initial coroner's inquest found that Bethlehem staff had not responded on time when Lewis had lost consciousness. A subsequent inquiry in 2017 found that the police had acted with excessive force. After a campaign led by Olaseni's family, in November 2018, the British Parliament passed a new law to prevent the excessive use of restraints in mental health hospitals. The Mental Health Units Act of 2018 is colloquially known as Seni's Law. The second case took place on the 31st of August 2014. Chris Brennan, 15-year-old patient with a history of suicidal ideation and self-harm by swallowing objects, entered the communal toilet of the ward at 8pm. He then wrapped the lid of a deodorant in tissue paper and swallowed it. Chris called for help, but staff could not resuscitate him, and he died of cardiac arrest. The coroner's inquest found that Bethlehem had no guidance to manage the risks posed by objects which might be used for self-harm. Moreover, the emergency equipment in the ward did not include a laryngoscope, which, if used in combination with angled forceps, may have saved Chris's life. These two cases, however, should not detract from the fact that Bethlehem Hospital is nowadays a modern, well-run institution. Annual assessments conducted by the Independent Care and Quality Commission consistently provide positive reports for Bethlehem. The latest 2021-2022 report gave the hospital an overall rating of good. St. Mary of Bethlehem, later Bedlam, started its history as a pioneering facility, arguably the first psychiatric hospital in Europe. For centuries, it mirrored society's concept of how mental patients should be treated. At times, they were to be ignored. At times, Times they were to be restrained, humiliated, and punished. Luckily, in more recent times, patients were finally respected and eventually treated according to the findings of psychiatric research. In Shakespeare's times, the cry of to bedlam with him was uttered as a threat. Today, it should sound as a possibility for recovery.